it's a bright uh, and sunny Monday morning here in Davao City. Though we were jolted by a quake um, early this morning at 6.45 with epicenter in Surigao. Well, it has been a year since the series of quakes hit our city, rocked the Davao region and other neighboring towns. So we are quite um, uh, scared a little bit. Okay, so, but before anything else, let's pause for a moment to pray for the peaceful repose of the soul of our colleague, a Mindanao's correspondent in Kidapawan City, Malu Manar, who passed away last night. Amen. My name is Ami Kabusao and I will be your host for this morning's forum. And with me are Rob Gumba, our technical director, and Yasa Campo, our social media guy. This is Reporting Mindanao, an online forum organized by Mindanao's, streamed live on YouTube, Facebook, and later today uh, at the Mindanao's podcast. So if you can listen to it, if you have missed some parts of this forum, you can listen to our podcast. Voices of Marawi is the first episode on the series Monitoring Marawi. We will be listening to our resource person, Member of Parliament, Anna Tarhata Basman, who will present the findings and recommendations of the Bangsamoro Transition Authority Special Committee on Marawi on the recovery, reconstruction, and rehabilitation efforts after the 2017 siege in the country's lone Islamic city. To introduce this segment, may we call on Mindanao's Editor-in-Chief, Carol Argilias. Uh, go ahead, Ka. Maayong buntag sa atong tanan, gikan dinhi sa Davao, Mindanao. Welcome back to Reporting Mindanao, an online forum initiated by Mindanao's to discuss various concerns in Mindanao and to provide journalists a venue to enhance their understanding and reporting of these issues. On October 30, we launched our Bangsamoro in Transition series by looking into the midterm review of what has been done and has not been done by both the Bangsamoro government and the national government midway through the three year transition period. Today, we are launching our Monitoring in Marawi series with voices from Marawi because that is what the 127-page report of the Bangsamoro Parliament's Special Committee on Marawi will share with us. Voices from Marawi still crying for attention 37 months after President Rodrigo Duterte declared Marawi liberated from the terrorist influence. We have 19 months to the end of the Duterte administration and only 13 months to December 31, 2021, the self-imposed deadline of Task Force Bangon Marawi or TFBM to finish rehabilitation efforts in Marawi. Please note that TFBM is the main body created by the national government for the recovery, reconstruction, and rehabilitation of Marawi. The Special Committee on Marawi, or SEM, was created in September 2019 by the then six-month-old Bangsamoro Parliament and constituted the following month to look into the status of the Marawi recovery, reconstruction, and rehabilitation efforts, cognizant of the fact that TFBM is in charge of the Marawi rehabilitation efforts and the SEM is merely complementary and supplementary. The SEM had planned to submit its report by March or April this year but the lockdowns due to COVID-19 delayed its submission. It was finally presented on August 27 and approved by the parliament on the same day. During her presentation of the report to the Bangsamoro Parliament, Member of Parliament Anna Tarhata Basman, the Vice Chair of the SEM, 
explained that from the beginning, it was clear to them that their work will complement the efforts of Task Force Bangon Marawi. And to do that, they understood that they needed accurate and complete information on the status of Marawi and its residents. The SCM conducted six exhaustively deliberative committee meetings, three informative public hearings, and numerous public consultations, went on field visits, gathered data and evidence, talked to experts and listened to the displaced and affected by the Marawi siege, who they thanked for sharing their stories, inviting them into their homes and lives, and telling them the problems they are facing and the aspirations they hold. According to Basman, we have brought your voices to the parliament, you have spoken, and we hope, along with all of you, that our leaders may hear. We thank MP Basman for honoring our invitation to share with us more about the Special Committee on Marawi, what their 127-page report is all about, and what the response has been from the Bangsamoro government and the national government after August 27. Salamat. Uh, I would like to introduce to you our resource person for this morning. Uh, she is attorney Anna Tarhata Basman, who was appointed a member of parliament as government nominee on February 25, 2019. Before taking office in 2019, she had already served the Banks of Moro in various capacities as legal chief of the government negotiating panel to talk for talks with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front at the office of the presidential advisor on peace forces, as deputy executive editor of the National Commission on Muslim Filipinos, and as legal consultant of the Bangsamoro Transition Commission. MP Anna finished both her BA in Public Administration and Juris Doctor at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. She later pursued her MSc in Islamic Finance and Management at the Durham University in the United Kingdom under the prestigious Chevening Scholarship Program. In Parliament, MP Anna chaired both the Subcommittee on Consolidation of Marawi Resolution under the Committee on Rules and the Ad Hoc Committee on Revenue Code before their dissolution. She is currently Chair of the Committee on Accounts and Audit and Vice Chair of the Special Committee on Marawi and concurrently the Chair for its Subcommittee on Marawi Rehabilitation. She is also a member of the BTA Committee on Rules, Committee on Finance, Budget and Management, Committee on Social Services, Committee on Trade, Investment and Tourism, and Committee on Human Settlement and Development. Uh, may we now call on Attorney uh, Basman. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Ma uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Miss Amalia. Yes, hi, ma'am. Uh, yes, thank you very much po, for having me. Mm -hmm. uh, I thank... My pleasure. I thank the News for holding this media forum today. Uh, Ms. Carol and I have been talking about this as soon as I think we delivered our committee report in the, in the BTA, in the plenary. However, due to uh, a lot of conflicts in schedule, we were only able to proceed with it today. And I'm very grateful that uh, everybody has joined us this morning. So if I may proceed, if you've been following uh, local developments in the region regarding the rehabilitation of Marawi, uh, you'll know that we recently jump-started the Bangsamoro Marawi Rehabilitation Program, or BARM MRP, with the signing of Memorandum Circular Number no. 3 by the Chief Minister last October 20, and that we recently convened its Program Steering Committee, or PSC. The PSC, which is the policy-making and oversight body of the Bangsamoro Marawi Rehab Program, is tasked, among others, with evaluating and approving project proposals from our ministries. 
something which we already begun doing, starting with a slate of three projects for the Ministry of Social Services and Development, the equivalent of the DSWD in the region. To give us, however, a better sense of where the BARM MRP is coming from and what direction it will be headed, it is important to discuss the report of the Special Committee on Marawi, which we'll be doing today. In the next slide, okay. I don't think what happened to Marawi on May 23, three years ago, needs repeating. We know that even after the city was declared liberated, the suffering of the Maranao still continued. By the time we were crafting our report sometime in June, and even up to now, thousands remain displaced. Three years since the siege, we are still only seeing the beginnings of rehabilitation. To add to all these, the difficulties faced by displaced Maranaos are compounded by COVID-19. Uh, in fact, in September, the Nao del Sur, including Marawi City, had to revert to the Modified Enhanced Community Quarantine, or MECQ, because of the spike in cases. So this was the context uh, uh, around which our report was submitted and delivered in the parliament. Um, to give a brief background, the Special Committee on Marawi, or SCM, was created after many different MPs filed resolutions to look into the status of the rehab knowing the experiences of those displaced and affected by the siege, and in keeping with the mandate of the BTA to supplement national government efforts thereon. The SCM, where I serve as vice chair, was created in September last year and was tasked to look into the status of Marawi recovery, reconstruction, and rehab efforts. We knew that our work in the BARM, where the Bangsamar organic law itself, is only complementary and supplementary to the efforts of the TFBM. And we recognize that in order to be effective in this, we need complete and accurate information. So in the span of several months, interrupted only by COVID-related restrictions on mobility and public gatherings, we held public hearings and consultations, we did our research, we poured over documents, we talked to experts, we went on field visits. The result was our report which summarized all of the national, local, regional, and non-governmental interventions initiated in the aftermath of the Marawi siege, articulated the sentiments and crucial concerns raised by the internally displaced, and outlined our recommendations as a committee to the Bangsamar government, as well as other government instrumentalities to address them. The report, uh, uh, if you haven't seen it already, we've uploaded it in our website and in the Facebook page of our office, is uh, quite a long document. It's over 100 pages. And I don't think we will be able to cover everything comprehensively today. And even when we presented it to the parliament last August 27, that was already our disclaimer. So therefore, I, I think it's best if we limit our discussion to the key highlights, and then maybe we can address the questions uh, anybody may have regarding other sections uh, of the report uh, later. We also emphasize in the parliament that this report does not cover all that needs to be said and all that has been done in relation to Marawi. I don't know how many pages is required to do all of that considering it's been three years and also considering the multitude and gravity of the issues faced by our people and the uh, emerging issues that uh, continue to uh, evolve today. This report, uh, contains only what was presented and submitted to us as a committee and the collective and the result of the collective wisdom of the special committee on Marawi. So let's go first to the key first key issue raised during our interactions uh, with those affected and displaced by the siege. So this includes in, uh, issues involving land, property rights, and the shelter, which uh, cover concerns regarding property ownership, the military reservation, clearing and demolition, taxes, housing, and temporary shelters. Uh, we also discuss core necessities, which include utilities, livelihood, education, and health, public works, uh, as well as other issues, which cover data issues, questions with regard to inclusion, scope and priority, uh, transparency, transitional justice, inquiries on the handling of the war and security. So one of the most crucial cluster of issues we encountered our concerns over land, property rights, and shelter. I'm sure you know this, that land has been a complicated issue in Marawi even before the siege. Aside from competing ownerships, we have overlapping claims, encroachment, and reliance on traditional institutions of property ownership and possession, something that is not uh, necessarily 
recognized by our formal institutions. And this has been pointed out as one of the causes of delay in the rehabilitation efforts. Of course, this problem cannot be discussed uh, without mentioning the concerns raised regarding clearing and demolition. Some of those who consented because they did ask uh, some of the homeowners for their consent to demolish, some of them were worried about the when they saw that the contractors left no visible markers or physical boundaries on their land after the demolition. They would have wanted to do this themselves, but the way Cambisita or the program of the task force where the IDPs were allowed to return to their areas uh, to briefly visit them, but were not permitted to conduct any repair, construction, or fencing, uh, prevented the, the owners from you know, putting demarcations in their property boundaries. So now that uh, all that they are holding on to is the assurance from the local government and all of the other relevant authorities that the exact boundaries will be followed since they are included or mentioned in the registered titles anyway. But this uh, uh, is quite problematic because it, it will only work under the presumption that all of the homeowners uh, are holders of registered titles or that there are no overlapping claims. So it becomes a source of tension within the communities. In relation to this, there also appears to be a problem with respect to the proceeds of the sale of the debris in the Ma'a. So after some time, uh, uh, after the, the properties there were demolished, uh, there was a move to get the debris sold and uh, the, the proceeds were consolidated into a trust fund. And the local authorities, by uh, resolution of the local Sangonian, mentioned that this will the, the proceeds will go to the homeowners. However, by the time that this issue was raised to the attention of brought to the attention of the committee, no guidelines yet has been set as to how the proceeds will be distributed to the homeowners. Um, another concern is about the construction of the Camp Ranao military reservation as well as what were, uh, the people were told is going to be an outpost in Kapantaran, uh, an area uh, within the most affected area or Ma'a. There are fears uh, amongst the residents that uh, more of them will be displaced permanently in the future and that even a, uh, an outpost, a mere outpost, is going to stir resentment and disturb the long-term stability of the city. Uh, another issue is uh, real property taxation. Despite some concessions in the previous years, some, uh, for example, um, um, the amnesty, the discounts for early payment, some IDPs are still unable to pay. Uh, for obviously, rehabilitation has barely started. Uh, the property owners are still unable to return to their uh, land and therefore profit from them. And yet they are being asked to pay for these taxes. This becomes even more relevant because uh, there is a current program allowing the re residents of some sectors within the Ma'a uh, to return and repair their houses. And this is called Katagombalay. But the Katagombalay, any property owner who wishes to be allowed to uh, repair or uh, reconstruct their houses uh, is required, among others, to acquire a building permit. And one of the requirements to, uh, for that building permit is uh, an updated payment of real property taxes. So, uh, but, but of course, as the special committee is aware that this is a difficult balancing act for the Marawi LGU, given the need to raise revenues uh, required of them by law and on the one hand and accommodate the realities of the IDPs on the other. Social housing and private residential housing also pose problems for our IDPs. Uh, many, we, many of those we've talked to have serious concerns regarding the permanent shelters, which are for the most part located uh, far from the city center. This is actually a usual problem for large scale housing, but the, our IDPs are asking whether their moving to the shelters will end up costing more since their livelihood are in place of employment are located in the Marawi, Marawi city center. And for their children, schooling might be more expensive because of higher transportation costs. This is already a problem, for example, for those, shelter, for those who are residing in shelters outside of Marawi or far from the Marawi uh, city center, 
we've talked to, for example, some college students who've had to stop their schooling in MSU because of the added cost of transportation to the university. Based on our discussions as well, it is, it is unclear who will be allowed to avail of the permanent shelters, how they can finance these, and whether availing permanent shelters will, um, will mean that they have to give up their properties in the Ma'a. So these are important questions, especially since uh, the task force Bangon Marawi has declared that priority for the permanent shelters shall be given to those whose properties are located in reclaimed areas and where government infrastructure will be built. So the, the, uh, the connection being made by the IDPs is that uh, those who are given permanent shelters will not be allowed to return to their, they, they would uh, end up giving up their properties in the Ma'at. So therefore, ad additional information on what sort of housing assistance IDPs can expect and what the plan now is for private housing instructors is, uh, is among the rallying cries of our IDPs. And finally under, finally, under this cluster, temporary shelters have also their share of problems. IDPs are, of course, grateful for the assistance, but their experience in, is that uh, the temporary shelters are too small for the average Maranao uh, family size. We hear of the need to sleep uh, in shifts or outside the unit, or even asking neighbors and relatives to allow other members to sleep in their homes, especially during inclement weather, which is now uh, the reality of uh, Marawi City. The cramped spaces have also forced the Maranaos to disregard their religious and cultural norms, piercing through their sense of Maratabat and self-esteem as a society. <clears throat> Lacking in shelters and now also in the sectors in the Ma'a where residents are allowed to return gradually are the core necessities for comfortable or even just dignified living. They talk of inadequacy of water supply. There is a problem with uh, solid waste management. Electricity is an issue. Livelihood assistance and health services were also raised. Uh, as to utilities, there is a severe shortage of water, potable or otherwise, in the temporary shelters. And the situation in the Ma'a, where the facilities have been destroyed by the months-long uh, uh, airstrike, uh, is likewise dire. This has contributed to sanitation and hygiene problems in the shelters, especially with the inadequacy of sanitation and waste management systems. Imagine then the impact of COVID in such a setting. I do, IDPs don't even have enough water for what the authorities require of basic health protocols. Electrification has also not been completed in some temporary shelters. And it's not just the daily lives of our IDPs that are suffering. Their livelihood, education, and health are in peril too. Just to add that when we personally went to the shelters uh, last month, the IDPs mentioned that it, uh, it was a good thing that it's been uh, raining. It, it has been, it's the rainy season in Marawi these days because uh, rainwater has become available to them. But this is not going to be the case when uh, come dry season. And also uh, one of the shelters in Boganga, which houses more than a thousand families has experienced uh, landslides, which made its surrounds in social media because of the very heavy rains that they've experienced in the past uh, uh, a few weeks ago. Um, as to livelihood and income, three national agencies are involved in providing livelihood assistance to the IDPs. So that's DTI, TESDA, and uh, DSWD, along with supplemented by regional the regional government, LGUs, and different NGOs. Despite this, however, not all are reached by uh, this kind of interventions and in fact, the IDPs are decrying the fairness of choosing or the process of choosing the beneficiaries. So because um, of um, lack of synchronicity in, in the interventions of this, uh, all of these agencies and the, the other stakeholders, some of the IDPs receive assistance from three, two, or one, and some uh, receive none at all. So the inequity in the, of the situation has caused tensions within the communities. Many IDPs also note that they receive the same starter kits or livelihood uh, assistance, um, and they belong to the same community. So the effect, net effect is really to saturate the local market when it comes to this livelihood uh, interventions, which, which means that uh, tensions are, uh, are 
stirred and economic recovery is prolonged. It might be that the strategy is to <clears throat> provide as many micro to small scale livelihood interventions, so as many IDPs as possible. But the problem is with this kind of, with this design of intervention, we have ignored the role of former big time traders, which were prevalent in, in, the, in this part of Marawi City. And, and who, in fact, can help uh, make local economy recovery faster. So add this to the complaints about overpricing, skill intervention mismatch, and the quality of equipment being distributed. Under education, while the Department of Education has focused on the 20 public schools destroyed within, the, within, the, within Marawi City, not much assistance has been given to the many private schools, madaris, or madrasa, or religious school, and other educational institutions in the Ma'a. Um, this consists of the bulk of the educational institutions in the city, and they, uh, they're, they're uh, being ignored is um, going to be a problem, a problem even for the absorptive capacity of pub the public school system within the city. So there are no interventions uh, for them to give them a chance at repairing or constructing their facilities and therefore res resuming operations. Uh, on health, IDPs also reported problems with health services. So similar to education, distance uh, of the shelters to the available facilities is a big constraint to access. Regular medical missions, which are conducted uh, are not enough for the IDPs, especially for cases of emergency, like when somebody needs to give birth, they, they are very far from the, most of the shelters are very far from the nearest uh, relevant health facility. So they are uh, calling for uh, the, the institution of medical clinics in every site, for, uh, including the uh, provision of affordable medicines. So given the problems with uh, inadequacy of water supply, hygiene and sanitation systems, lack of health services, cramped living conditions, and the, uh, uh, the COVID outbreak, uh, what we're seeing is a perfect storm waiting to happen in, this, uh, living, in the living conditions of our IDPs. <clears throat> so these are the issues that affect the daily lives or the daily realities of the IDPs, but there are concerns that permeate the entire situation, uh, uh, which we cannot ignore. So number one is completeness of the list of, data, of beneficiaries. Data is a big problem in Marawi rehabilitation. So both Katanor and the FAP, which were the systems instituted um, by the national government, uh, which are uh, good attempts at databasing, uh, but are recognized even by the authorities as incomplete. So the problem is that this list, this Katanor most recently, is the list that uh, is a basis for the inclusion of the IDPs in any of the interventions of the national government agencies. So that means that exclusion in the list means exclusion in the aid that is due every IDP. But not only on the profile of the IDPs, also data on land possession and, and ownership is problematic. So the, the decision to strictly adhere to formal documentation like land titles, tax declarations, deeds of sale, and other forms of transfer is uh, not reflective of the reality of the complexity of the property arrangements within the Maranao society. So again, this has caused tension and anxiety to those who have been in, the possession, who have been in possession of their lands for generations prior to being displaced uh, during the siege but whose claims are not evidenced by documents recognized by authorities. <clears throat> um, from what we've seen also, there appears to be questions regarding the inclusion, scope, and prioritization of those affected by the Marawi siege. There is a sentiment that non-Maranao hostages who survived or those who are affiliated with the ones who perished in the 2017 siege received more urgent assistance from the government compared to the IDPs in Marawi. As to transparency, it's also a critical issue. IDPs are saying that they are not provided with uh, clarity uh, and that they demand uh, 
and the clarity as to the assistance that uh, they are entitled to, the processes, the timelines, and targets when it comes to rehabilitation, and the policies that relate to their return to their properties in the MAA, including whether for some of them, the impossibility of their return is a foregone conclusion. Um, there's still so much to be done that can be done to inform and update the IDPs, especially uh, so that uh, perceptions of mismanagement and suspicions of corruption are dispelled. <clears throat> Related to the call for transparency is the clamor for inclusive participation. For instance, the Mujahideen or uh, the freedom fighters are uh, thought to be uh, uh, should be recognized as important partners, not just in the rehab efforts, but also in the long-term development and stability of the city. And uh, an even, even bigger problem that was raised to us during our public hearings is that wide acceptance of the Bangon Marawi plan uh, seems to be absent. Indicative maybe of the lack of ownership of the IDPs uh, in the feel, uh, brought about by the feeling that inclusive participation from the stage of its uh, conception is uh, uh, leaves much to be desired. Um, IDPs also highlighted the importance of transitional justice or TJ in the case of Marawi, so that the allegations of looting, vandalism, and trespassing over private properties during the height of the siege are not simply forgotten. Many of those also uh, affected have lingering questions regarding the handling of the war. Our people want to clarify what factors led to the siege beyond the victim blaming. Uh, in the early stages of the Marawi siege, I think it was the Maranaos or the residents of Marawi that were being blamed for the eruption of the war, and it's pervaded the earlier discourses. Um, they want an investigation on the violations committed by both sides, those who are uh, waving the black flag and those from the more uh, from the uh, agents of the state and also have a full accounting of the dead and the missing. And uh, finally, under this cluster, all of these compounding problems lead to a Marawi that is exposed and vulnerable to emerging security issues. IDPs have reported renewed recruitment, which is likely driven by frustration over the pace of the rehabilitation. There has also been a reported spike in illegal drugs transactions and while never an excuse, perhaps the lack of adequate social economic opportunities have forced some of them to resort to selling drugs. So the SCM came up with a list of recommendations uh, outlined, uh, divided into immediate, uh, immediate to medium term, medium term to long term, and uh, these three being addressed to the Bangsamoro government. And the last one, on matters that are outside of the mandate of the Bangsamoro government. So for the immediate recommendation, it includes the setting up of an office or board for the BTA-led rehabilitation efforts, meaning the rehabilitation initiatives that are um, funded and uh, solely uh, implemented by the BARM government. And, th and this number one has been addressed by the creation of the Program Steering Committee of the Mara Rehab Program of the Office of the Chief Minister. We also recommend addressing data gaps through a centralized, up-to-date, and comprehensive database of household profiles, the assistance they received, and property ownership. We also need to improve IDP's access to assistance and ensure food security. As to access to assistance, we note that there are a lot of IDPs, for example, number one, that are not part of the database of the TFBM, Number two, who are part of the database but are located uh, very far from where this uh, assistance are distributed or given out. So we, we uh, recommend that uh, something be done so that uh, interventions are reached all of the IDPs who have uh, erstwhile been neglected. Um, in the next slide, please. Under immediate to medium term actions, uh, we recommend hastening the construction or an improvement of wash facilities. We also need to hasten electricity access, as I mentioned earlier. There are shelters which have no, um, uh, which have not, uh, whose access to electricity have not been completed yet. They're still under, uh, uh, in, in, in the process of being installed. And there are those who, uh, are now being where before their electricity have been shouldered by 
um, uh, relevant authorities now they are being made uh, they are being made to pay for their elect electricity consumptions in the shelters uh, noting that a lot of them don't have uh, sources of income regular sources of income yet um, we also need to prioritize we also recommended prioritization of livelihood and business and um, and designing them in such a way that interventions are nuanced according to the capabilities of the naturally entrepreneurial Maranao IDPs. And finally, we recommend that uh, the delivery of these kinds of services, particularly livelihood, be synchronized so that we avoid the problems uh, encountered by, the, uh, by similar interventions of the national government. We also uh, mentioned uh, in the report uh, ensuring that education and health services are continued and uh, enhanced. And finally, the more, uh, I think specifically, we recommended that the, those displays be assisted in identifying their property boundaries to, um, to avoid the, what I was describing earlier, community tensions when it comes to overlapping claims because of the, uh, because of the uh, uh, removal of their uh, property boundary demarcations. And uh, finally, uh, for what the Bangsamore government, for the recommendations that we address to the Bangsamore government and under medium to long term, we recommended that we support permanent housing development. And this is quite relevant because we have our own Ministry of Housing and uh, uh, Human settlements and development, uh, which uh, which is uh, primarily mandated to look into the housing situation within the region. Uh, meanwhile, for entities outside BARM, we raise the cause for transparency, especially through frequent updates on plans and developments, better consultation mechanisms, and the establishment of uh, perhaps an independent audit and accountability mechanism for all of the past interventions and uh, efforts on Marawi rehabilitation. We also emphasized and uh, again urged the Congress to pass a compensation law in a previous resolution of the parliament. We've already uh, um, expressed the sentiment of the, of the parliament, urging Congress to immediately pass the compensation uh, law as well. The, we also called on in our report, uh, the national government to address emerging security concerns and, to al and number four, to allow the property owners exercise of their property rights within the Ma'a. For instance, allowing them to clean, clear, and fence their properties without needing uh, uh, any, uh, getting prior permission from the authorities, especially if uh, these property owners already have shown inc incontrovertible proof of ownership. And finally, we uh, recommended that we raise the matter of monitoring the rehabilitation of, uh, Mara of Marawi City to the intergovernmental relations body uh, that is uh, composed of uh, representatives from both the national and Bangsamoro governments. And uh, that concludes uh, the recommendation, the, the content of the report of the special committee. And after this lengthy process and this lengthy report, I think it's clear uh, to us and to those who are uh, in the ground that the current process and phase of rehabilitation is uh, unsatisfactory to those who are affected by the siege. From what we have heard, it's not meeting the expectations, much less the needs of those who are displaced and affected. And so much more needs to be done to ensure that the rehab is inclusive, genuine, and comprehensive. But the good news, as far as the Bangsamoro government is concerned, is that there is a lot of room for the Bangsamoro government um, to, uh, to supplement the efforts of the national government. And one of this is through using the well-grounded and evidence-based insights that the Special Committee on Marawi, the BTA, has offered to the national government through our report. And as I mentioned earlier, at least on the part of the Bangsamar government, uh, work is already underway on the recommendations of this report. Maybe we can discuss during the Q&A portion as the specifics of these interventions. We are uh, cautiously optimistic with how the Bangsamoros uh, work on Marawi rehab is unfolding. But this is going to uh, be a long process, and uh, this, this is the part where I, I uh, make the call to our IDPs to be a little bit more understanding with, uh, with uh, 
the their transitional government. We're also dealing with uh, uh, creating a bureaucracy, but of course we we wish not to shirk from our responsibilities when it comes to our constituents in Marawi. And uh, as to as to making this call uh, uh, at this juncture. Uh, moving forward, I think this rehabilitation also needs the help of our friends in the media. Aside from disseminating critical information, correct information, and we have initiatives, we also need we would also need your help to ensure uh, through your reportage that we will remain faithful to our aspirations in making the SAM report and the findings and recommendations that emerged from it a reality. And perhaps more importantly, we need all the help we can get to amplify the voices of those who were displaced and affected. Who continue to suffer today? We are, I think, uh, better positioned than other uh, communities which have uh, suffered through calamities such as this. Because even three years from now, the Marawi situation is still being talked about, uh, and we we hope that it's uh, something that we can sustain until finally the people of Marawi are able to return to rebuild their lives in Marawi stronger, more prosperous, and more peaceful. So thank you very much, and I I would welcome any questions that you may and each one of us. Have. Thank you very much, Attorney Basman. But um, let me just ask the first question. You were mentioning about the IDPs mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the the problems they face when they uh, in their in their desire to go back to to the place that they they used to live and that they're uh, far away from uh, their source of living and even uh, it has disrupted a number of uh, things like. Um, education, for instance. So, um, how do they? How do they? What's this? How how do they react to to the committee hearings? Were they present during the hearings that you mentioned? And uh, what was their suggestion? Mm -hmm. So, uh, we conducted a special committee on Marawi. We conducted a few public hearings, and among the first ones, we devoted to hearing from the IDPs themselves. So we gathered representatives from the shelters and uh, a lot of them were still very emotional when they tried to relate, how, relate to us uh, their current situation. And um, most of the things that we, we included in the, in the recommendation portion of our report actually came from them. Mm -hmm. So their complaints about the inadequacy of water supply and our concomitant recommendation to look into this immediately is a response to what we heard from them during our uh, public consultations. Ooh, okay, so um, we have another question. How has the Bangsamoro government and national government responded to your recommendation after August 27? Mm -hmm. So I can speak for the Bangsamoro government. The immediately after we reported in the parliament, uh, the officers of the special committee in Marawi were called by the chief minister to a cabinet meeting to present our findings and recommendations. And the result of that, after a series of uh, of uh, meetings, is the creation of this Marawi rehabilitation program. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be noted that as uh, early as uh, the budget season for the current budget of the BARM, the 2020 budget, which happened uh, late last year, 500 million pesos was already devoted for, Marawi, for a Marawi rehabilitation fund. But uh, the chief minister wanted the utilization of that fund to be informed by the findings of the special committee, knowing that we were holding public consultations and direct uh, engagements with the uh, affected communities. So in August 20, that memorandum where the program steering committee for the Marawi Rehab program was created, um, we are led by our deputy chief minister for, uh, for uh, Lanao del Sur. And I, I am also a member of that program steering committee. Um, we've also, as a program steering committee, we have the function of approving uh, projects to be implemented by our regular ministries in the region uh, and funded by the Marawi Rehab Fund. We are also tasked to monitor 
any other interventions from the Bangsamoro government implemented by the Bangsamoro government relevant to Marawi Rehab. So we've conducted our first meeting uh, last week and we've approved uh, three uh, project proposals from our Ministry of Social Services and Development. And through to our recommendation, those projects deal with uh, um, establishing a database, a, com uh, a continuing, uh, you know, uh, a database of the profiles of the IDPs and uh, uh, being more ambitious about completing all of this, uh, all of the names of the people that are that were actually affected by the siege and that who actually resided in the Ma'a prior to the siege. We've also approved um, some of their uh, projects when it comes to water. So uh, water supply for, for some shelters, water rationing is the only option since we cannot, uh, any construction of uh, like a deep well system is going to be ineffective because of their topography. So things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've also approved um, uh, projects that pertain to accessibility of potable water, um, the sludging of their you know septic tanks. Because in 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 a span of three years, um, a lot of a lot of the shelters have been um, neglected in this in this particular matter, which uh, exacerbates their uh, already. Um, sorry health situation so those are the things and we've also approved um, um, livelihood assistance for for particularly for home-based idps which are usually uh, invisible to a lot of the government interventions because they are not located in in the shelters and they are usually uh, usually forgotten when it comes to designing interventions as to the national government, we've uh, we've had meetings with, uh, a, to the credit of the task force Bangon Marawi, they've been very cooperative with the special committee of the parliament. When you we are conducting our hearings, they they themselves and the national government agencies that were uh, that are under them attended our public hearings, public consultations. And even after we submitted our report, we were still able to, uh, we were still able to uh, have conversations with them and uh, with the promise of continued collaboration with, uh, with the task force. Okay. Uh, so there's another question from Bong Sarmiento of Mindanus asking about the environmental aspect of the Marawi rehabilitation. The question is, how would the BARM government ensure that there will be less impact on the environment vis-a-vis -vis the rehabilitation efforts? For instance, the debris with no monetary value, how and when and how and where will they be disposed of? Mm -hmm. So that's a good question, but uh, the debris management, as I was saying earlier is uh, the, the debris that we're talking about are located in Ma'a, were located in Ma'a. And uh, because Task Force Bangon Marawi has proceeded with um, the groundbreaking of uh, central infrastructure within, the, within Ground Zero or Ma'a, this debris have been cleared. Uh, and... This was conducted by them without the participation of the Bangsamoro government. In fact, the problem has now arisen that um, the owners of this debris are asking where the proceeds of those sales have gone and whether they can, uh, they are going to be paid the equivalent of, uh, of what they own in terms of debris. So that's that's as far as debris management is concerned. It's It's not within the... It, it's not something that the Bangsamoro government was uh, part of or is a part of because it's uh, the, the distinction is if it's within Ma'a, uh, it's uh, under the control of the Task Force Bangon Marawi and the national government agencies. So in fact, anything that the Bangsamoro government wants done within that area, it has to uh, coordinate and collaborate with the Task Force Bangon Marawi. In, as to ensuring the environmental impact, that is something that we, of course, will note. 
Um, we have a ministry on environment and natural resources and energy in the in the Barm region. So far, we have not approved projects that will have uh, that will necessitate an environmental impact assessment because we're still uh, focusing on the more immediate needs of the IDPs. But um, we are uh, going to be looking into that in the PSC when when such projects uh, come to our, are brought to our uh, table. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bong has another question uh, and he wants to be clarified. Is the Barm government calling for the abolition of TF Bangon Marawi with the recommendations for a BPA-led Marawi rehab? Uh, so, so straight answer to that is no. We, we have not, through our uh, report, called for that. We only emphasize that as a regional government, a limited as may uh, as uh, it may be, we still have a um, mandate to respond to the needs of our constituencies. So that is what we meant. What we meant when we said BPA led initiatives, meaning these are things that we can do even if uh, the BOL itself reserved the authority over the rehabilitation of Marawi Task Force Bangon Marawi. Um, that's why we focus our interventions. And our recommendations to the Bangsamoro government on things that can be delivered even if uh, even if we are not given access, for example, to uh, the most affected area. So no, we are not uh, doing away with Task Force Bangon Marawi in our recommendations. And in fact, we have called for, uh, we have asked, repeatedly asked Task Force Bangon Marawi, and uh, they have verbalized their uh, their openness to a more collaborative uh, uh, working relationship when it comes to Marawa rehabilitation. Noting also, if I may point out, that we don't have the machinery of the 56, I think, national government agencies of Task Force Bangun Marawi. We definitely also do not have the, the billions of budget that was given to Marawa rehabilitation under under this, uh, the structure that is uh, defined by the, by the task force. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, from Lindy Peto of IID, um, what particular body in the IGR will the SEM raise the issue on Marawi? There is a central IGR body. So uh, aside from those that are specific in terms of fiscal uh, matters, um, uh, infrastructure and uh, the host of other issues of uh, of the IGR. There is a central IGR body. Uh, as far as the Bangsamoro government is concerned, it's uh, the co-chair is uh, Minister Mohager Iqbal. So that is our uh, that is uh, our call for this entity to raise the matter to the national government through through the IGR. And we've done this in the past. Um, the, some of the MPs have communicated to Minister Iqbal the misgivings of the, of the Maranaos when they were still uh, moving fast with the establishment of the Camp Pranao when, it was, uh, when, the, when they broke ground on this. So uh, we see this, uh, this mechanism as an effective tool for directly communicating to the authorities how uh, our IDPs feel about the developments in the Marawi rehabilitation. Okay, we have another question from Carol. Um, how much of the recommendations were reshaped by the pandemic, mm -hmm. now with the pandemic? Um, was there enough time to incorporate suggestions on current living conditions of IDPs in shelters mm -hmm. to housing programs by the Ministry of Settlement? Um, so, so yes, yeah, so to, as to the first question, when we were, our original timeline for the special committee was to end our public hearings in March. So we were planning to do it on the second week of March, but then the, or the third week of March, but then the lockdown, uh, kicked in. So all of us were unable to, to hold public gatherings by then. That's why when we resumed session in the parliament in June, what we did was to immediately call the special committee again 
to recalibrate our timelines and redesign our uh, public engagements. So, in fact, before we held our final uh, public hearings, we were scheduled to have three. Our five our final public hearings were supposed to were were intended for the bar ministries the international ngos and it was already just scheduled to be conducted in cotabato as opposed to marawi where we held the january and february public hearings so what we did before the public hearings in july we went back to marawi um, in a smaller scale we conducted conversations with the idps to get updates from them how the the uh, pandemic has impacted their lives uh, more than it would have had the pandemic not uh, not reached us. So definitely our recommendations were also uh, informed by the current situation of the IDP. So for example, the urgency of the water supply has become, was accentuated because of the need for sufficient water supply for the uh, for complying with health protocols. So also the livelihood issue we was also uh, has also become more stark because of the uh, um, restrictions on mobility and the ability to find a livelihood amongst the IDPs. So that was uh, the impact of, of the COVID uh, crisis to our report. I'm sorry, can you remind me again of the second part of the question? Uh, okay. Uh, the second part was... Um, it's the housing. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, the how housing. Much, how much, yeah. Yeah. So um, the one of the things that uh, the, the Marino IDPs were complaining about the temporary shelters is is it's designed according to national standards, meaning what the national sees as a regular uh, size of a family. So it's usually three or four, uh, a household with three or four kids. That is not the reality of a regular Maranao family. So it's become really cramped for them. And usually it's not only housed by a single household. Usually there are sharers and you know, other family members who live in the shelter so with them so uh, the way that the uh, ministry of uh, human settlements and development saw it is that first it needs to make the shelter the permanent shelters that it proposes to construct for the idps and the rest of you know uh, it's it's going to be the regular design for the housing uh, projects of the region is that at least it needs to have it it needs to at least have three rooms uh, in accordance with uh, the the culture and cultural and religious requirements, where you have the the parents sharing one room, all the boys sharing another room, and all the girl members of the family sharing another room. So that was the impact of the of the um, of the conversations with the IDPs on the design for the housing. Um, and I, if I may just add that when we went around the shelters, we also noted um, some of the things that need uh, to be incorporated in the in the housing projects that we will be introducing uh, or uh, implementing in the barn. For example, uh, many of the shelters have unpaved access roads from from the main road, so it's become a real uh, a real problem for those residing in those shelters, especially if they have an emergency and they would require somebody who's sick or somebody who's about to give birth to walk through the, the uneven terrain or sometimes during inclement weather through the mud just to get uh, to uh, the nearest health facility, which is already very far. So those are the things that uh, we discovered and have recommended in our report. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Carol. Uh, can you tell us the status of the 500 million peso Marawi fund mm -hmm. from the Bangsamoro government? Um, how much has been spent, and for what? And, and for what? No? Mm -hmm. Will the fund will the fund be reverted to the national treasury if not spent by year end? Mm -hmm. 
So to answer the last question first, so the beauty about the fiscal autonomy given to the Bangsamoro, to the BARM, is that any unspent uh, amount within the BARM budget does not revert to the National Treasury, but only to the BARM Treasury. So if, for example, we are not able to fully utilize the 500 million Marawi Rehab Fund, it only goes back to the Bangsamoro Treasury for the appropriation, for uh, you know, appropriate reappropriation by the Bangsamoro Parliament. As of now, uh, from the first meeting of the PSC, we were able to allocate uh, an approximate uh, 79 million pesos of the 500 million uh, towards the projects that I mentioned the, uh, earlier about the MSSP. So for data gathering, actually profiling of the IDPs, for the livelihood assistance that can be given, particularly targeting the home-based IDPs, and for the, um, as a response to the water supply needs of those in the shelters. Mm -hmm. oh, and she has a follow-up question on that. No? Um, has this report been presented to Task Force Bangon Marawi? Have copies been sent to the Senate and House of Representatives? And have they responded to the recommendations mm -hmm. made here? So our, uh, as soon as we came out with our report, uh, we have directed the Secretary General of our Parliament to send this out to certain agencies. So Task Force Bar Bangon Marawi is one of them. The Senate and the House, I think, knowing that they have specific committees on Marawi, have also been uh, given uh, copies of our report. Um, so far, we've only been able to talk to the task force. Um, we haven't presented to them the report as I have done this morning or as we have done in the parliament. But uh, we have mentioned to them specifics like uh, the need for uh, a more comprehensive and a more complete database. We've mentioned that to them. We've also talked to them about the possibility of of uh, a partnership, especially when it comes to the Bangsamoro government wanting to implement um, initiatives within the most affected areas. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question from Carmela Fundrena from uh, Raptor. Um, uh, is there data on how many Marawi residents are still missing? What are the efforts being done, uh, being done to help the families still looking for their loved ones? Mm. So uh, officially, I don't think there, there is, as far as the Bangsamoro government is concerned, we, have, we don't have that data of the missing. That's why it's part of our recommendation in the special committee that a full accounting of the dead and the missing is conducted. Assistance to uh, the families of the deceased, uh, I'm not so certain if the national government agencies have a specific intervention for the families of the missing and the of those who are missing and dead, but mm -hmm. that's why our call for in our committee report is to uh, to incorporate transitional justice in the Marawi rehabilitation and not just put it in the side in the sidelines. We see this as a as an important factor in ensuring the security of the city and uh, ensuring that a, a repetition of what transpired in 2017 is minimized or totally obliterated. Okay, there's another question from Carmela again. Uh, what happens if the December 2021 is, is not met? If the December 2021 agreement or whatever is not met <laughs> deadline <laughs> so the december 2021 is a deadline that task force bangon marawi has given itself to fully uh, to complete all of its uh plans for marawi rehabilitation uh what happens after then your guess is as good as mine carmela <laughs> <laughs> i yeah. mean uh, people are already uh you know, there's a lot of frustration already when it comes to the pace with which this rehabilitation has uh, moved. Um, there's a lot of also um, uh, uh, uncertainty, uh, feelings of uncertainty with that deadline. Uh, if you look at, uh, if, if you visit Marawi, the most affected area, 
it's um, a lot of places are leveled and i think maybe what uh, with that those kinds of pronouncements about december 2021 being the target for a full rehabilitation what the people are expecting is they're all also their own uh, uh, reinstitution in their in their private properties uh, what we're seeing uh, in the past few weeks and months is the focus of uh, the task force and its uh, uh, its partner agencies on uh, uh, on constructing uh, central infrastructure like a government infra those things so even now when we're what, 13 months away from December 2021 uh, the people are not seeing how the timeline is uh, where they are in the timeline where their the reconstruction of their houses uh, is in the timeline of uh, December 2021. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but in, in a part of part of that uh, question is that um, how do you uh, gauge the rehabilitation of efforts of uh, task force uh, Bangon Marawi? Um, we we understand that uh, it's a very complex issue rehabilitating a city with its host of problems uh, when it comes to. Uh, land ownership, when it comes to uh, a formality of documents, when it comes to uh, where they are, you know, uh, typically when the, we have, for example, in small uh, Moro or even Mar or particularly Maranao communities, when there are crises, it's hard to locate them because they are uh, the the uh, culture is not very welcoming of <clears throat> the idea of staying in shelter. So it's the, the automatic reaction is for the relatives to house them in their own um, in their own uh, residences. So we understand the difficulty that this has posed in terms of locating the IDPs and many other things that have uh, that, that the FBM has has had to face. Uh, because of the very particular, a very unique situation when it comes to dealing with uh, Maranao IDPs. But also, um, maybe we can also expect a little bit more from them because it's been three years. So that's, that's the meat of the Special Committee on Marawi Report. We, there, is a, there, there are some portions of the delay that are justifiable, that are understandable. Um, especially since the, the the ones implementing are agencies that are not that may not have been um, oriented towards the particular uh, practices or traditions of the Maranao society, and therefore the learning curve may have been a bit uh, uh, may have been uh, uh, steep. But again, it's been three years, so. Uh, maybe it's uh, about time that uh, we speed things up a little bit more. Uh, that I think is uh, what the special committee wanted to do in uh, informalizing our our process for uh, for gathering the information through our public hearings and consultations, so that people are able to see where loopholes are. And therefore, help them identify how to plug them, or maybe think about how to plug them. Not necessarily any recommendation coming from us, and also to uh, help our IDPs uh, communicate the to the proper authorities the frustration over you know the the speed by which this uh, this rehabilitation has been handled. Mm -hmm. uh Here's another question on peace and security. Uh, how is the peace and security in Marawi amid the rehabilitation and the pandemic? Mm -hmm. So as I've said in the, as we've mentioned in the report, um, there are concerns about the emerging security threats in Marawi. There are a lot of factors that uh, are at play right now, especially in the time of pandemic where more people have lost uh, income opportunities, livelihood opportunities. But even before that, um, narratives about oppression that are grounded on the, 
the phase of the rehabilitation are already surfacing or are already being um, taken advantage of by uh, certain groups with more dangerous tendencies. So that is a security, uh, there, that is a pervading security uh, uh, threat to the city and its uh, nearby localities, including the entire region, I suppose. Um, there's also a report on the spike of uh, legal drugs transactions. So that's also um, another thing that uh, that is developing within the shelters. As I said, shelters are usually located um, far from where uh, livelihood opportunities are available. So, and this is not an excuse, but this uh, this is a reality of some of the shelters where there has been a report of spike in these kinds of illegal transactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Carmelito Francisco of Mindanao Times would like to ask, uh, is this consideration to culture in, in the implementation of projects and programs? Uh, the BARM government definitely uh, well incorporates uh, those considerations on culture and uh, practices. Uh, in fact, uh, the PSC itself is uh, composed of a majority uh, uh, Maranao MPs, so that uh, these things are not ignored when we when we deliberate on and when we approve projects for funding under the Marawi Rehabilitation Program. Mm -hmm. uh, from Momo Miguel, um, do the IDPs based in other cities have to go to Marawi? For the profiling, or is there an arrangement with other LGUs through the IGR to allow Im um, immigrants to register mm -hmm. or participate in the profile on the profiling in places where they currently reside? Uh, so the, we haven't um, cemented the process for this, but as far as the proposal is for the profiling is concerned. We are going to the Ministry of Social Services and Development, which is the ministry that will implement this, is going to um, um, uh, seek the help of enumerators, which will be dispersed to areas. And when we ask them if uh, they will be uh, going to areas outside of Marawi, the, the answer was in the affirmative. Uh, the, there is also an opening for those who are outside Marawi to um, to uh, get their profiles uh, submitted online, so we're also looking at, looking at those things, uh, and all of this will just be validated by uh, our our validating team. So we are actually anticipating a deluge of submissions to the initial in the initial stages of the. IDP profiling, and then we'll just uh, we have just discussed with the ministry a um, uh, process for validating and screening through this uh, submissions of names. So, uh, short answer: No. We recognize that it's going to be a difficulty, and we don't want to replicate the, the difficulties experienced by the IDPs when they were attempting to get included in the Katanor. So, we're we've redesigned our IDP profiling in such a way that it. Uh, uh, imposes lesser burden, though we also know that it can be, you know, an, uh, there can be an interview or data gathering fatigue among our IDPs. But we, what we're trying to do is to lessen that uh, burden upon them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. So this is another question about post-pandemic uh, adjustments to to your recommendations uh, from Yas Ocampo of Mindanus. Um, what will be the adjustments? Uh, social distancing, plans for sanitation, such as a, a stable water supply, mm -hmm. funds for PPEs, and quicker response uh, through the Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the MOH, our Ministry of Health, the equivalent of the OH in the region, also submitted uh, a list of recommendations that uh, respond to that question on the on the addressing the impact of the pandemic on the IDPs. We have not discussed that yet in the PSC. Um, the reality of, again, of, of Marawi is that when we held our meeting there, 
it was interrupted of course because of uh, the pandemic some of uh, our invited ministries had to join us via zoom so but the reality in Marau is that the internet is a little bit less stable and also we were interrupted by a power outage so we had to cut our meeting short and that that's why we were only able to approve some of the projects that were presented to us but so yes the MOH has a list of project proposals on uh, on PPEs on having barangay health uh, um, stations in more areas within Marawi City but also we are looking forward to monitoring the implementation by our ministry of the DOH funded uh, Marawi Rehab program so they were able to the DOH downloaded funds to the Bangsamore government uh, to the directly to the MOH for this purpose and we're looking forward to looking into that and seeing how they can be enhanced by subsequent initiatives when it comes to addressing the the covid pandemic oh yeah um we have a question from samraida of jaika kotabato office mm-hmm. uh ang status ng land tenure uh, moa with owners of the land uh, ng temporary shelter sa marawi so ang um, the situation there the just to provide context uh, to that question the temporary shelters are uh, located in lands that are owned by somebody else and uh, i believe i'm not sure if this is the this is uh, uh, the case for all of the temporary shelters but uh, we know that some of them have are, are on a 5 year lease so a lease from 2017 and which will expire on 2022 we when we visited the shelters a lot of the idps uh, have mentioned to us the camp managers the, the leaders of each, each of the shelters have mentioned to us that there are lot landowners who uh, are willing to uh, to you know give them more time to not uh, take back the land uh, after the fifth year uh, termination of the lease contract, uh, provided you know, certain conditions like if the IDPs are not unruly or things like that. We haven't checked. Uh, we haven't talked directly to the MOA owners. Camp management is under the jurisdiction of the local government. But, uh, but thank you for bringing this to our attention and we'll look into this. But that is what we know, that after five years, most of the shelters uh, lease uh, with the landowners will expire. Okay, so um, that ends our question and answer portion. Um, we would like uh, we would, we'd like to ask Carol if she can uh, log in, uh, return to, I think because she has a problem with the internet try. connection. Uh, oh, hi, hi. Yes, yes, Carol. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you for joining us in another episode of Reporting Mindanao. Thank you for attending the launch of our Monitoring Marawi series through Voices from Marawi. Again, we thank MP Anna Tarhata Basman for sharing with us the findings and recommendations of the Bangsamora Parliament's Special Committee on Marawi. The SCM report is available in the website of MP Basman at mpbasman.ph and yes, you can Google Special Committee on Marawi Report plus in the news and you can download the file from there as well. We posted an article on the SEM report on August 29 along with the SEM report itself and the speech delivered by MP Basman when she presented the report to the parliament on August 27. Nagang salamat and we look forward to seeing you again in the next episodes of Reporting in the Now. We hope you will join us in the next episodes of Monitoring Marawi. We hope to feature soon updates from the Task Force Bangon Marawi and from Congress on the compensation bills and from the Marawi backwits themselves. We will also start soon our series on other equally important issues in Mindanao such as COVID-19, the state of our environment, business, etc. 
Again, daghang salamat.